Our next speaker is um, Ozi Mosindi. He's a uh, digital product uh, owner at uh, HSBC, and he's going to give us more of a global perspective on open banking and, and APIs, how a big group, a global group like HSBC thinks about APIs. Ozi, if you want, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wait for them to try and get me a clicker so I don't walk far from the laptop. But while he's doing that, I'll quickly introduce myself. So I'm Osama Cindy. Uh, I head up the product team that leads our global developer portal in HSBC. Um, some of the team are here today, so good. Um, what I'm talking to you about today is really, as Ishmael pointed out, some of the ways we're responding to open banking in some of our markets uh, globally. Um, but also the nuances between those markets. Um, and as, as I'm sure you've heard throughout today, the opportunity around partnerships and ecosystems, some of the challenges around that, uh, and how we think we can get around those challenges as well. But before I start, um, I was reflecting recently on why I actually enjoy open banking and open APIs. Um, and there's a story there, so if you don't mind me, indulge me for a couple of minutes while I, while I share that story. Before I start, actually, though, the, the energy in the room is a bit low. Can I ask, can I ask who are, how many people are like technology in, in their day jobs, refer to tech, technology? Okay. And business? Uh, you can see my quotes because that's what my story is about. Okay. Where's the clicker? Okay. Anyway, let me stop my story. So um, my background is in applied computing. Um, I used to be a Java developer, a certified one in the days of Sun Microsystems, if people remember that. Um, and I went on to do a doctorate in something that started off as management information systems and ended up in information behavior, which is more like sociology. So I like to think of myself as a well-rounded individual. That's how I think of myself. I don't know if I am, but anyway. Um, when I started out my career uh, in Barclays uh, many, several years ago now, my first role was as a solution architect, um, working for an enterprise architect. And when I'd be in rooms with people, when we're talking about initiatives, right, people would often refer to us as technology. They understand the technical stuff, implying that we didn't understand anything else. It was frustrating, right? So I said to myself, I actually think I, you know, I know something else. So I started looking for roles that had to do with finance, strategy, proposition development, and I ended up in product management. In that time, when I sat in rooms talking to people, they would refer to me as the business. So I asked you guys just now, I'm actually not sure what frustrates me the most, being called tech or business, because the good news though is open banking erased that for me, right? Because it's, I get the opportunity to now work in a space where I work on a very technical platform. I'm building something that's gonna hold APIs, et cetera, so I get to do all the technology I, I wanna do. But I also think about the commercial aspect as well. How do we respond commercially? How do we go on the front foot with open banking? So I just thought I'd share that because that's what actually excites me the most about this space, the fact that you're beginning to bridge that gap between what we label as technology and business, et cetera. Okay? So let's, let's go. I think I have my clicker here. So I, I'm not going to introduce HSBC. I think hopefully most people know, you know what we are. What I am going to say, though, is... We, we, we're unique in terms of footprint, um, in terms of banking. We span over 30 countries in terms of where we operate, and we serve about almost 40 million customers in those countries. So a lot, of, a lot of the initiatives which people have talked about today in terms of open banking affects us in some way or another. Um, and I'll quickly give you a taste of what some of that looks like for us. And the clicker is not working. Okay. Anyways, it is. Sorry, guys, tech was slow to respond. So I think that the, the, the thing is you wait for one second before you, now we're here. Cool, thanks. Um, so this is just to point out, I'm sure you've heard about different uh, open banking regimes today. This is just to show you the breadth of what we're having to deal with in the organization. There's open banking in the Americas, in Europe, 
Middle East, Asia Pacific for us, and we have, you know, mar we have significant presence in most of these markets. What we are trying to do is have a coordinated response to all of this, some kind of central strategic response to all of this, but it's easier said than done. Bearing in mind, in some of these markets, we actually have multiple brands. So in Hong Kong, for example, we have Hang Seng Bank and HSBC. In the UK, we have First Direct, m and Bank, HSBC. Then if you add the John Lewis partnership cards as well. So we're having to respond not just to all these markets, but to multiple brands within a market as well. It's coming. Yeah, figured it out. Okay. Um, what we see across the board in terms of how APIs are grouped, all of the, most of the regulations which we see today in terms of mandating banks to open up APIs, et cetera, the APIs fall within four categories broadly. Some might not fit in here, but this is what we, we currently see. Product information, which is pretty much information on the products you offer as a bank. Interest rates, types of products, all that kind of stuff. Account information, this is the transactional data that you collect off the back of consumers. Um, payment initiation, uh, that was just talked about now in the New Zealand speech. Um, and product opening or product origination, which is really about opening up uh, accounts or products through third parties uh, via APIs. So I just wanted to touch on some of the nuances in terms of what we're seeing, the differences between the regulations or regimes in these markets. Some are regulatory driven, um, i.e. I. being driven by a central regulator. Others market driven, like the US, for example, regulatory driven here, Hong Kong, etc. The central versus decentralized is common, yeah. Uh, is linked to the first point, but more like in some instances, there's uh, independent bodies that have been invite, like set up to help manage this centrally. Uh, as opposed to individual banks having to respond on their own. The drivers are different as well. So if we take the UK and Europe, I think the main driver was customer choice and the premise that the customer owns the data, so they should be able to move it you know, to different organizations. In other places, it's more around innovation for the regulator really trying to increase innovation in financial services space. Right, this is, um, maybe I'll just use the laptop, guys, because I'm having to wait for this thing to come up. Okay, so specifications, we're having to, in some instances, regulators or independent bodies that have been set up are having to dis define specifications of APIs to the very you know, nth detail, which I think aids adoption and, and participation. In other cases, there are no specifications per se. So Hong Kong, for example, again, you know, banks are having to build to their own uh, specs, albeit with some guidelines from, from the regulator. TPP, I think this is a term that's used now broadly across all the markets which, which have been part of, which is really a third party provider who gets access to the banking API. Um, the onboarding and verification of them, again, differs across markets. Here in Europe, around the second payment services directive, we're seeing central register in the UK, central register where you can go look up uh, already verified or vetted third parties. In other markets, we're seeing where banks have been asked to do the onboarding of these TPPs themselves and verify them themselves, which is a lengthy process. Think about a procurement process. Those of you that have worked with banks or having to onboard with banks before, just imagine what that looks like. Reciprocity. This is really uh, a, only in Australia. I've only seen this in Australia, but I thought it would be good pointing it out. Um, this is really about in Australia, the, the, the regulation is called consumer data rights, um, and it's far beyond banking. It's not just about banking. It opens up to utility sector as well. But what they mandate is if you want to consume the APIs, you have to also expose yours. Uh, what's interesting for me, though, is when does utility companies begin to consume banking APIs, would they be mandated to open theirs as well? So that's one to watch out for. And consent management, this is really about the length of uh, the validity of the consent which you collect from the, from the end user. In the UK, I think it started off with three months. Uh, it's changing soon. In Australia, it's about 12 months, and you have other things in between as well. And 
availability of testing facilities. So we saw PSD2 uh, in Europe here, there was the mandate to have a sandbox and a place to host your documentation. In other places like Singapore, Australia, there's a central body that's actually going to host the documentation and you don't really need to provide that yourself. So this is just painting a picture for you to understand the level of complexity we've had to deal with within the organization. Um, if we start from 2018, which is when the UK response was sort of completed and work towards where we are now, there's been a number of markets, and I'll show you a timeline. Don't bother reading this slide. It's for you know, dramatic effect in terms of the complexity. Um, Australia, obviously, have just finished their mandate this year. We're expected, the big four banks are expected to open up APIs by February. Uh, we're not a big four bank in Australia, but we are mandated to open up by July. Canada, they're in consultation, so we're hoping to hear soon. Uh, Bahrain, we're already doing some piece, uh, work for them in terms of trying to make sure we hit deadlines in early 2020. Hong Kong was published in four phases. Um, phase one, which was product information, we responded to that in January. Uh, phase two, mainly around product opening and originations, we've just completed that a few weeks ago. And we're expecting to hear from the regulators around phase three and four in terms of timelines pretty soon. Mexico, we've already done product information there, so there's a tactical solution that's already there in place, and we're expecting to hear from the regulator again in March next year in terms of what next for timelines. And Singapore, again, there's already work going. There was a lot of consultation early this year around specifications uh, in terms of use cases, et cetera, because there's a very unique uh, use case there where, there's a, where the monetary authority is involved in using uh, the identity solution called SingPass to help create use cases around, around the APIs. And France and the UK and PSD2, you guys know about already. So this is the view I wanted to sort of paint for you to understand how you know, complex it is to try and respond to all of this in a central, coordinated way. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those challenges in, in a little more detail. However, what I want to try and focus on in the next few slides is what you've probably heard about all of today around ecosystems and partnerships, et cetera. I do believe this is the competitive advantage of the future. Um, and I want to bring that to life with a, um, an example. As a product person, I do not believe in making decisions on a data point of one. So take this with a, you know, but I, I will give you my experience and just explain that so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, I, re I have been, had a phone contract, a mobile phone contract with a telco for many years now, the same provider. But I started getting frustrated by them a few years ago. I started getting billed wrongly. I started getting, um, I had to call up, spend 20, 30 minutes on the phone to debate my bill several times. At one point I got cut off wrongly as well. So I was hugely frustrated. I was actually so motivated to leave. I was waiting for my contract to finish, right? So my contract was up and I went online to go check for my new deal. But I had a phone, uh, a music streaming service that was part of my contract with this telco. Um, and bear in mind, all my music was in there, all of my playlists, everything, I love music, that's how I keep myself grounded. Um, so I was like, whoa, what am I gonna do? I need, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna look for another deal with another telco that has the same music streaming deal. 10 pound a month, not big, but bear in mind I was paying for Netflix, Amazon Prime, Now TV, I don't know what else. So I was trying to reduce my bill, not increase it. But I checked everywhere, and it was only this telco that had this deal with this music streaming service. What did I do? I renewed my contract, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so, so the, the point being, it's a very extreme example, but the point being, if you build the right partnerships in this new world, you're not only going to get new customers, you're going to retain the right customers as well. So it is really important, but there has to be a way to systematically think about this and build the right partnerships as well. So there are many frameworks out there that talk about, you know, how do you think about what APIs you want to open up, or, you know, who do you open up to, et cetera. But this is a very basic one I just thought I'd share. It's, it's a banking value chain, nothing complex about it. It's financial services, but the, the premise is, 
how do you think about the things that you do really well and how you expose them and how you then complement yourself using partners in the places where you're not so strong? So this is the things we do really well, right? We identify and verify our customers. We do anti-money laundering, right? We do fraud checks really well. We manage balance sheets really well. People who need these kinds of services, how do we expose it to them via APIs? Our products, we've innovated products over so many years, right? Um, how do we do two things? One, allow third parties to begin to help us originate those products in different places where customers go when, you know, they're not always in our channel. Wherever they go, how can we make that available to them? But also, how do we integrate better with the third parties that actually help us fulfill these products upstream? Data companies, other things, right? And our mobile channels, digital channels, we have a lot of um, customers active in those channels today. How do we begin to integrate third-party services that provide additional value for our customers? And an example being, you know, I think most people would agree that things like after um, services you get, after you've opened your account or loans, et cetera, in terms of personal finance management are not the things bank are strongest at. In, in terms of, you know, compared to fintechs at this point. Um, but we are making strides in that department. So I think we, we partnered with Bud, uh, I think 18 months ago now, where we did the uh, app called Arthur, which was, again, well received. And we've just announced our balance after bill, shameless plug, uh, on our mobile app recently. But, you know, the point being, we know that's not our strength. And where we can think about places where we can help supplement that, we will do but also we're making strides in our, own, in our own way. Right, so I've just touched on two things. I've touched on the regulatory challenges, which we, you know, we face in terms of how we need to respond in a coordinated way, but I've also talked about what the future looks like in terms of partnerships. The two things are not mutually exclusive because we have to work in the same time frame within the you know, regulatory regimes to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of ecosystem development and partnerships. So these are some of the challenges I see. I've already talked about the different needs in the different jurisdictions and how that makes it difficult to build a coherent picture of definitely you know, a partnership strategy. How does that actually affect the end user, which is the developer as well? Right? How does that affect them in terms of the experience which we build globally with them? And this one is for me is a personal experience. As a product person, you have all the different parameters which you actually use to um, prioritize your roadmap, right? Um, you have the business value, technical feasibility, all the exciting stuff. But what happens when everything on your roadmap is actually has a hard deadline because you need to meet regulation? The roadmap goes up in smoke. And that means you need to respond sometimes with tactical solutions, with a plan to migrate to some you know, uh, strategic platform at some point. But all is not lost. I genuinely believe there are ways we can get around those challenges. And key for that, for me, is the developer experience. And that's what we've been working hard on this year. We've done user research in the UK and Hong Kong trying to get this right the first time, but we know we're not going to get it right the first time. We're going to probably iterate around this. But the, the plan is to have some coordinated way where someone who comes and engages with HSBC would not see the complexity of all the differences of all these initiatives across markets, but actually have some kind of fluent experience on the front end. So look at these images. You might be saying something soon. I'm not going to say, but just some of the things we've been working on. The other thing is the value on the platform, right? So if you think about it, the experience can only go so far, but what is the value on the actual platform? What is the thing that draws people there? And we call these premium APIs. These are the APIs I've talked about before in terms of the things you do really well and the things you want to expose. Um, this could be going over and above what the regulation specifies in the things like uh, a payment initiation API. You might want to add additional data to that for specific partners or you, know, you might want to do a lending API, whatever. The, these are the premium APIs over and above what's mandated that are actually going to drive the value for us. So I'll just try and skip through my final 
uh, few slides. Why should develop? So think about six months down the line, or one year down the line, we now have this ecosystem, you know, good experience, premium APIs, et cetera. Why should people come to us over and above others, right? There are three things, and I'll just rattle through them. Interesting data sets. We have a huge expat customer base. We have a huge international customer base. Global APIs, things like treasury APIs, cross-border payments, and you know, uh, significant customer bases in those markets as well. And obviously, I won't be in API days if I don't mention to Sobi and, and Open Bank Project. Um, we, we have done some work with them. I've known the guys for a few years now, but we have done some work this year with them in Hong Kong. Um, and we're looking to expand that in the next, you know, in the near future, which we'll hopefully be able to share soon. But we've done hackathons with them and looking to do that in the future as well as a way to not just ideate, but also incubate APIs for, for um, imagine you, you, you have an API idea and it's going to take six months to one year to build. How do you put that in a sandbox somewhere where you can begin to ideate with that fairly easily? So I'm just going to wrap up and uh, talk about what the future holds. That's my final slide, Ismail, if you, if you permit me. But I'll just give you a summary of what I've just gone through. So we talked about our global uh, initiatives in terms of open banking in our different markets. We talked about the nuances uh, in those different markets. I then projected forward to what we think you know, partnerships mean for us. But talked about the challenges that the regulatory regimes would also present in, in that story and finally talked about how we think we can get around that with developer experience and premium APIs. Final slide. For us, we're going to round up our 2019 activities around regulatory responses. In early 2020, you're going to begin to see some signs of partnerships working in our key markets like the UK and Hong Kong. We're going to begin to do things around hackathons and community building in mid-2020. Yeah, and by the end of the year next year, going into 2021, we expect to begin to shift our focus towards a more commercial mindset in open banking as well. Thank you. I hope you found that useful. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you so much, Ozzy. Do we have questions for Ozzy? And by the way, you have two minutes automatically additional when you have a shout out for Tisobi for sure. We have a question over there. Hi, also a quick question. You, you talked about the external challenges uh, towards implementing the new way of, of using APIs, etc. How about internal ones? Um, I mean, we know big ships turn slow. Uh, how have you managed that in such a big organization? Uh, yeah, I'll just use the mic here. Is this on? Um, that is a, such a complex question to answer. Um, it, it has been a journey. I personally have been involved in that journey for almost two years now. Um, we've gone from a point where people didn't want to talk about APIs to where we now have APIs at off-sites and at senior level conversations, right? So it's been quite a journey selling, I, you know, educating people, et cetera, um, but also trying to get the right platforms in place as well. Um, but I, I genuinely think that tide has turned and we're moving towards, you know, a more open, more um, sort of a space where people now understand the value of what this brings. And I think, yeah, it was challenging initially, but I think we've turned the tide. Yeah. Um, hi, I've, I've got a question. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting what you said about uh, being more open. Um, and I was wondering whether you could explain why HSBC. Uh, uniquely in the UK, has um, notified the industry of its decision to stop trusting open banking implementation entity issued certificates from March onwards, because that is a hugely inhibiting um, action for those organizations that are running connections to HSBC today. So uh, I will give you a standard answer here. That is not within my, my remit to speak to. Unfortunately, there is a regulatory response team that, that you can reach out to for, the, for that. Um, but sorry, I can't, I can't give any more detail around that. Yeah. Great. Right. All right, Ozzy, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, this. So with that, we're actually... 
closing this track and uh, there is a break, there is a short break, about 30 minutes and we're back here at 4.15 please. So be here back at 4.15. Thank you very much and a big round of applause.